Hello, welcome to this next video. Today we're looking at Luke, the gospel writer, but he's not just a gospel writer. He writes the Acts of the Apostles, or we could call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit as well. So Luke writes a lot of material for readers then, but for readers today, and also those who will come after us, the readers of tomorrow. And there's so much in the birth narrative, but also in the other works of Luke, which are really important. And if we know a little bit more about Luke, it might help us just to get our heads round uh, why he records what he actually records, because there's uh, information in Luke's gospel, which is exclusive. It's only Luke that uses it. So shall we dive into Luke's gospel then? So Luke, we know, is a medical doctor, and we know that because he knows Paul very well, and Paul speaks of him in Colossians 4, verse 14, and he refers to him as a beloved physician. Now, we don't have any information about who Luke treated. There's no um, evidence, there's nothing recorded about who he maybe looked after, who he nursed, who he was there for. But we do know that he was very, very um, aware of people's well-being and he was very concerned for people's well-being as well. Who better than a physician to record the unexpected pregnancies of a very old couple and a much younger couple. And it's how he records that, which um, illustrates to us his, his medical background. Now we know Paul had a lot of health problems, so it may even have been that he was Paul's doctor. You never know, do you? But by looking at Luke and who he was, it will give us that added depth when it comes to reading his words. We know that Paul had a lot of health problems, recurring health problems. If you want to look that up, go to 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 to 9, but also Galatians as well. Galatians 4, uh, 13 to 14. And we don't know, do we, whether Luke was his doctor, but wouldn't it be something if he actually was? So who better than a doctor to record the experiences of these two pregnancies, the experiences of these women, the older woman and the very young woman. And Luke in his gospel makes it absolutely clear that women were as, were as important to men in God's purposes as the men were. So Luke also has a real place as well for the poor the somewhat despised shepherds as they were, they were included in God's world as well. He didn't balk at the mentioning of the uh, pauper's offering of just two small pigeons either in Luke 2 verse 24. So we see this doctor's touch in his interest for those who are struggling. Now, the degree to which Luke sensed the significance of all that was happening around the birth of Jesus, I think is seen in these emotional reactions. He really describes what was going on beautifully in terms of the couple, first of all, the older couple and, and those kinds of worries. We feel the emotion, too, of the shepherds first being absolutely terrified and then being full of joy when that message is given to them. So this beloved physician, you know, he can also be detected, can't he, in his concerns surrounding Simeon and Anna and how these old saints all of a sudden realised that the Messiah was in front of them, the Messiah was in their midst. So Paul is exceptionally good at conveying this. He's also a really careful writer as well. Now, at some point, he must have shifted from being a doctor to being um, a researcher and a writer. But of course, what he did informs who he became. And that's pretty much the same for us all. So we know that he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He wrote a lot 
of the New Testament. And in this kind of adopted style of a historian, um, well, it's just so wonderful that he's gone out and he's done the research. I imagine him just interviewing and interviewing and interviewing and, and making as many notes as he could, as many notes as is possible. We only notice really that he is the writer, certainly in Acts of the Apostles, when every so often he uses a plural we, which suggests he as the writer was there as well. So Luke presents himself as a researcher who wants to give his readers a full and orderly and factual account, that account of the coming of Jesus into the world. So he writes to somebody, dear Theophilus, he says, many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place amongst us. They wrote what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so your excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from the beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. That's verses one to four in that first chapter. So it's clear that he found gaps in the available documentation and he didn't want to confuse anybody and he didn't want to deprive his intended audience of what they needed to hear. So the whole of the audience is represented in this one person who he addresses with real um, respect and significance. In fact, when he refers to him as, as your excellency, well, that would suggest that this person is a high ranking Roman official. You kind of get that from Acts 23, 26, and then chapter 26, verse 25. So he wanted to account uh, to, to his readership, this full, full account for intelligent people as well. And he's ready to work very, very hard to ensure that's done. We know that he met at least one other gospel writer. He was in attendance um, with Paul in Rome when Mark was also there. We know that from Colossians 4 uh, verses 10 to 14. And you can just imagine the conversations, can't you, between them. We can hardly doubt that they would have been sharing information between themselves, reliving their accounts of Jesus. And both valued evidence from eyewitnesses, those eyewitness accounts. And the result was that Luke presented as much as 40% of the material that's not in any of the other gospels. The first of this exclusive material, exclusive just to Luke, is his account of the birth of Jesus. So who were his informants? Where did he get this information from? Well, that is a question that we do need to ponder. Now, Paul implies that Luke was not Jewish. That's implied in Colossians 4 verses 10 through to 14. He wrote mostly in good Greek, but when he included material from Jewish sources, his, his style really reflects the origin. He does not tell us how he came to faith in Christ. But this strong connection with Paul and, and this use of language may mean that Paul led him to Christ. And again, wouldn't it be great to actually know that we don't? Wouldn't it be wonderful to know that Luke was indeed Paul's doctor and Paul led the doctor to Christ? And, and then because of this, he changes his whole outlook and wants to record for us today, centuries later, the importance of what happened. So we don't know how he came to faith, but we do know that he's got this really strong connection with Paul. So we, we mustn't forget that when we read of this birth narrative. Paul's calling was mainly to preach to people who weren't Jewish. So this means that the view of Jesus in Luke's gospel is the view of a non-Jewish person. 
So we're not surprised then when we see him include Simeon's note that the child is to be light to reveal God's will to the Gentiles as well as to bring glory to the people of Israel. So that's a little detail. But if this is to a non-Jewish audience, that's really, really big. So equally, it becomes clear why he wanted to include that doxology uh, from the angels to the shepherds about peace on earth, not just peace in Israel, but peace on earth. And his genealogy doesn't, um, doesn't stop at Abraham either. It goes right back to Adam, who was the son of God. And the rest of the gospel shows this universality of Luke's writing and, of course, Luke's message. It's also more than likely that, that Luke wasn't a Palestinian either. He himself tells us in uh, one of his writings, he uses we, he uses we in passages in Acts, um, that he came to Jerusalem with Paul when he brought the money to help the poor believers. You can find that in Acts 21 verse 19. And then Paul, well, Paul was taken into custody in Jerusalem and for safety was transferred to the port of Caesarea. And that's where he undergoes all those trials. But it was in his detention for two years, which was probably around about 57 to 59 AD, that Luke is again with him. And that's when he's sent under escort by ship to Rome, joining him at the beginning of the voyage. That's in Acts 27, uh, verse 1. So I like, I like the view that, that Luke did this research in those two years when he was unable to help Paul, who was in prison. And I can imagine him traveling up and down Palestine, asking people about what they could remember, what had happened all those years before. And, you know, he might have actually found Mary because often, well, certainly the details that he comes out with, the details that he shares, they must have come from Mary. They've got to have come from Mary. They're very intimate details, aren't they? Can you imagine him sat with Mary as she tells him the things that she's probably been pondering her heart all those years? Mary would have been about 75 years old at this point. And somebody called Alexander White says this. Was it time for all these things that she had kept uh, and pondered in her heart to start tumbling out when Luke found her. I imagine that could quite well have been the case. Was it the discovery of the extensive and indispensable role that Mary played? And Mary, maybe Mary told him about the other women that played an important part in the life of Jesus. Maybe it came from Mary and that's when Luke went off to find them. Why? because he's a sensitive doctor who cares about the experience of, of other people. He's got a sense of history, hasn't he, too? Luke senses this history, it's history in the making. And he senses these events are really significant. Why? Because he's living testimony for how it's changed lives. So we imagine him investigating in Galilee, in Judea. And we've got a real juxtaposition, too, between the kingdom of Herod, but the kingdom of God. We've got a real juxtaposition between the king of the world and the king, King Herod. Again, he comes to narrate this story, the story of how Joseph and Mary come to Bethlehem. So he puts it in its historical setting. It was because of Emperor Augustus um, that this census came into to being. And of course, Joseph and Mary had to make that journey to Bethlehem. So Luke puts this in a time frame in history. And he tells us that this is in the context, the religious context, in the time of Emperor Tiberius. That's Luke 3, verses 1 to 3. This historical sense is also important in some of the words and the most frequent words that he uses, good news. Now, 
the, the term good news isn't used at all by John and hardly ever by Matthew and Mark. The Greek word for good news is evangelion and Luke introduces it in the message of the angels, that message to the shepherds where they say, don't be afraid, I am here with good news for you, evangelion. So Luke and Paul almost exclusively use that term. They use those words. So Luke puts the birth of Jesus at least in the same bracket with the emperor of Rome. Proclamations were made on their birthdays. We're talking emperors here on other important events. And of course, people were told that they were celebrating good news, the good news of an emperor. And here for Luke, the real good news is, of course, Jesus, Jesus Christ. I want to close by um, just referring to the poetry and the music contained within Luke's gospel. It's a distinguishing characteristic of his work, and he must have got a real ear for poetry. I can't help thinking he was probably musical as well, because in the space of just two chapters, that's the two chapters on the birth of Jesus, we've got four songs, and we still know them from the Latin words with which they begin. So we've got four songs. The first one, Ave Maria. We all know that, don't we? It's the Ave Maria of Elizabeth. It's the song of Elizabeth. That's Luke 1, uh, verse 42. So that's the first song. The second song is, of course, the Magnificat, and that's of Mary. That's Luke 1, 46 through to 55. Then we've got the Benedictus of Zachariah. That's Luke 1 again, 67 to 79. And then we've got the Nun Dimittis, which is the song of Simeon. Simeon, that little old man. And that's Luke 2, verses 29 through to 32. And all of these, Luke says, were inspired by the Holy Spirit in those who spoke them. And those four songs are still sung today. And those titles are still used for those songs. And yes, they might be sung to different tunes in different languages across the whole of the world in different denominations, but they were captured by Luke because Luke sought out the people who knew what had happened. So the message of Luke to us is that all of us are distinctive in some way and that who we are matters and God can use who we are and our experiences to bring out the stories of other people. He shows us that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit um, just can be there and, in, and can work through us in all our talents and in all our gifts. And I like to kind of close, I'd love to close by just thinking about Luke but picturing him with Paul, talking away, talking about what, what they wanted to record for us, even us today. So that's Luke, a little bit of Luke done anyway. Take care and I'll see you at our next video, which is the Magi. Bye bye.